Hello, movie fans. We are the Cinema Joes back again talking about our top 10 favorite movies of the year. That would be 2015. I've got Noah and Justin here with their top 10 lists prepared for you. They are the core critics of our little collective. They're going to be talking about what they, uh, what they like most about these films. That is uh, not true, Casey. And, well, you are the core critics, and I'm just the peanut gallery. I'm the Joe in our Cinema Joes. <laughs> but, but equally core. It, well, right. I'm not saying it. I'm not degrading myself. Uh, but you guys are the professional critics. Profes- air quote professional. Um, so I guess without further ado, let's talk about our some of the worst movies we've seen before we get into our favorites. Yeah. Um, well, guys, I've seen a lot of movies. I do want to preface this by saying I did not see the really bad movies. Like, I did not see Fifty Shades of Grey. I did not see the latest Human Centipede movie. I don't go out of my way to see bad movies. But I, I read the plot. I read the plot synopsis for Human Centipede 3. <laughs> Holy shit, that was enough. <laughs> well, so so barring the so bearing that in mind, the worst film that I happened to see last year, for my money, is also the second highest grossing film of last year, and that is Jurassic World. I really <laughs> didn't like this movie. I do want to say it's not awful but i think the reason i don't like it so much is because to me it represents like everything wrong with the studio system in a year where the studio system gave us a lot of really good movies and i feel like jurassic world is the one exception to that the problem i had with it is that it it was rebooting a franchise and it did it in a way that was like tried to like comment on itself but didn't didn't know quite how to do it and i gotta say for a film that came out 22 years after jurassic park the fact that the dinosaurs were more convincing in that earlier film as opposed to this one is a little bit troubling to me they used a lot more cgi in the new one they used there was like one scene of they claimed yeah i could tell because you could tell they claimed they they claimed they used a lot of animatronics uh Doug Walker actually, in his, because he hated the movie too, and in his nostalgia critic stuff that he did about it, he theorized that they did use a lot of animatronics for the actual filming, but then afterwards, for whatever reason, the producers decided to slap um, CGI dinosaurs over the animatronics that they did. Because otherwise, they would have had no basis for claiming that they used as much animatronics as they did. I don't know if that's true, but that's one theory yeah. that I heard. I mean, so that I mean, that's just one of many problems in this movie. I didn't find the di- the dinosaurs don't look like they're occupying the same space as the human characters a lot of the time. I also, but that's it's again, it's more than just that. There are huge story problems with this movie. Uh, the characters of you know the characters played by Chris Chris Pratt and Bryce Dallas Howard, who are both very talented, get very one dimensional characters to play. On top of all that. It looks like the color has been kind of sucked out of it, and so it's not very appealing to look at. So to me, it's just it's just everything wrong with like with trying to make a big budget movie. Oh, you can make a big budget movie, but you don't need like a good story or characters that you care about, or even convincing special effects, and it will still make a ton of money. So that's my rant on Jurassic World. No, what's your worst your uh, worst movie of the year? Uh, well, I will. I'm going to start off by giving a minor caveat. The, this is not the worst movie that I saw, but the film that disappointed me the most was uh, Werner Herzog's Queen of the Desert, which is a biopic about Gertrude Bell, who is one of the most kick-ass and influential uh, historical fem- women that no one has ever heard of. So I was really psyched when I heard that Werner Herzog was making uh, a movie about her because she really deserves her own epic biopic. Uh, and it was just it was just flat and boring and did not in any way do justice to its subject matter. Uh, but that so that was the most disappointing movie I saw for all the hopes they had on it. But that wasn't the worst movie because it was it was still competently made. The worst movie I saw this year, no surprise at all, was Joy. Uh, the latest Jennifer Lawrence slash Bradley Cooper slash Robert De Niro vehicle by David O. Russell. All hail the Russell. I was gearing up for it all year because I knew it was coming out. I was gearing up to get really good and angry uh, and to write a a scathing review of it because I expected, well, American Hustle was terrible, but that got 10 Oscar nominations. Silver Linings Playbook was average, but it got like 8 Oscar nominations. So Joy's probably going to get 12, and I'm going to be really pissed off again. Um, 
thankfully, this time around, uh, people seem to have woken up to the fact that the, the way David Russell has done these last few movies just doesn't work. The camera work is messy and terrible. He jumps back and forth so much between different scenes and events and times that it's impossible to make sense of what story he's trying to tell. And Jennifer Lawrence is just, in all three movies, has been terribly miscast uh, in roles that she's not yet old enough and mature enough to play. And Joy was no exception to that. It was a mess of a film. Nothing about it made sense. It was good to watch it, only to be able to laugh at it. And yeah, I, I'm glad at least that audiences and critics alike have put aside the LSD and are finally waking up to the fact that whatever David Russell's been doing since he made The Fighter, which is the last legitimately great film he made, uh, isn't working and he needs to stop. So that was Joy. So so uh, let me let me uh, add on a little bit to in addition to the to the biggest letdown for me. I got three movies I think stand out this year. Uh, before we get into your top ten list, the biggest surprise for me before I do my biggest letdown was was Furious Seven. I saw this on the cruise boat and I no I didn't expect it to be any good. And uh, I have to say the end, the way the send off for um uh, the guy who died, what's his name, Paul Walker. Uh yeah was really well done, considering they pulled this footage out of the vault or something like that. Uh, and it was it was very coherent, very funny. The characters uh, had more depth than I expected them to have. The, the one-liners were terrible. Oh, my God. There was one line at the end of the movie that was like, you know what the thing about street fighting is? The street always wins. And then, like, the street, like, collapses. I'm like, who writes this shit? But um, but it was enjoyable. It was the biggest surprise. I don't want to say it was any good or anything, but surprisingly enjoyable. Oh, fair enough. The biggest letdown for me, uh, like Justin was saying, isn't necessarily a doesn't make it a bad movie, but um, doesn't stand up to I guess the hype to what I wanted it to be. Was and I may have said this on a previous episode, Age of Ultron. I because the. Fr- the first one is 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 probably one of my favorite movies. I think it's it's very uh, the first Avengers movie, very lighthearted, very um, great interplay between characters. While it wasn't anything substantial, it was very fun. And while Age of Ultron was was fun, it was too chaotic. It wasn't as 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 clean as the first one was. Uh, and I feel that like the interplay was was lost because of that as well. And while it hinted at some deeper things. It didn't have that depth and substance that it pretended to have. That, but those, and I know Justin and I disagree on this, but uh, that that was my biggest letdown. By no means a bad movie. It was still fun, just like Fury Seven was fun. I don't. That said, I don't clearly. I don't see nearly as many movies as I might like to, or as you guys do. So I have a smaller selection to choose from. There was one other movie I suppose I wanted to shout out. I was going to skip it because it's just, um, I have mixed feelings about it, especially after talking to, I don't, again, I don't think this was on air. I think this was kind of while we were waiting for Noah, we were talking about it, or while we were waiting for Justin to talk about it. I don't remember who I was talking about it with. The Steve Jobs movie that came out with, with Fastbender. I, I really enjoyed it at, up front, but then after engaging in discussions about it, I do see some of its, um, I suppose, failings. So I, I think it, it, it's um, a movie that deserves mention for for uh, particularly its structure. I love I love the writing of it. But yeah, that's my mixed. I don't know how to feel about movie. So uh, so yeah, then I guess let's get jumping into the to everyone's favorite movies. So before I get to the top ten, here are the films that just uh, just missed it. I really liked all these movies, and they're really worth seeing and checking out. Uh, and here they are in alphabetical order. I have Amor Fu, which is an Austrian film from Jessica Hausner. I have Amy, which is recently Oscar-nominated uh, documentary about Amy Winehouse from Asif Kapadia. I have Cartel Land, which is, I believe, also Oscar-nominated about cartel activity in Mexico. That's directed by Matthew Heinemann. I have Clouds of Sils Maria, which is a French film, takes place mostly in the Swiss Alps uh, from Olivier Assayas. And I also have Creed, which is the uh, boxing movie from Ryan Coogler uh, about Apollo Creed's son. I have The End of the Tour 
from James Ponsolt, which is a series of interviews between a journalist and uh, the, the late author David Foster Wallace. Ex Machina, the sci-fi film from Alex Garland. Girlhood, which is the uh, French film from Céline Sema. Uh, I have Room, which is nominated for Best Picture, I believe, uh, from Lenny Ab Abrahamson. And last but not least, I have When Marnie Was There, the latest Studio Ghibli film, hopefully not the last, from Hiramasa Yonobayashi. Those are my honorable mentions. I'm sorry, what was that one about David Foster Wallace? I want to look that up. Oh, that was the end of the tour. Uh, okay, so I also had a, a lot of movies this year that I really liked. So I, I was able to, I, I was able to, to crank out a top ten list that I'm pretty proud of. But there were still a lot of films that I really personally liked um, outside of this. I, I just want to start off by mentioning, uh, I deliberately when I create my top ten list and my honorable mentions, I deliberately try to be a little bit more idiosyncratic. So. Uh, a lot of the big studio or awards films like Bridge of Spies or Carol or 45 Years or um, Straight Outta Compton that a lot of you know critics have in their top 10 lists, those are all films that I saw and really liked, but they're not they're, they're not my sort of film. So I you know acknowledge them as good, but you're not going to say any of them here. Uh, so if any of you really love those films and you don't hear them here, that's not a reflection on them. Uh, these are the films that appeal to my very specific, very unique tastes. So my honorable mentions are uh, Kingsman, The Secret Service. Uh, I really want really to see that only movie. because of two scenes that completely blew my mind in, in the best way possible. Uh, Star Wars Episode Seven: The Force Awakens. The Salt of the Earth, which is a documentary over a Brazilian photographer uh, who, through years of documenting sort of war and crisis zones, lost his faith in humanity, but late in his life is is sort of bringing it back by focusing on nature work the revenant the most nominated oscar movie this year uh and widely expected to be the one that finally gets dicaprio his oscar amy the documentary about amy winehouse is also one of my honorable mentions then kumiko the treasure hunter a japanese film that is basically a play on the uh the thoroughly debunked urban legend that uh, a japanese woman found dead uh, near Fargo, Minnesota, was there because she thought that the Coen Brothers movie Fargo was real, and she died trying to find the uh, case of money that Steve Buscemi buries in the snow. Uh, it, it never actually happened, but this movie is sort of a, a what if What if it was a real story tell. Very good movie. Uh, Spy, the Melissa McCarthy movie, which was one of the funniest movies I saw all year. Mistress America, by Noah Baumbach, who also made Francis Ha. Room, also one of the big um, nominated films this year. Crimson Peak, the latest um, part Victorian romance, part ghost story, part horror film by Guillermo del Toro. Predestination, and uh, another big Oscar film, The Martian. So those are my honorable mentions. All right. Well, so I guess we'll start with... Uh... I'll start with my number 10 here. And uh, this is a film that I just saw yesterday. <laughs> so I'm still kind of processing it a now little I'm curious. bit. But I feel like it's, yeah, I, I mean, I feel like it's a good enough film to uh, to warrant uh, a spot on this list uh, for now. I do want to prep, again, I'll, I'll preface this by saying that I there are some more films that I want to see before I finalize this list. I'll have that on my website, uh, which I'll probably put in the description probably sometime before the Oscars I'll have the final list but this is uh, my list for now so my number 10 is The Hateful Eight the uh, Quentin Tarantino really? the most recent Ooh. Quentin Tarantino film I saw this yesterday I actually saw the Roadshow version of this, oh really 70 millimeter I saw it I saw the the other version well the weird thing is so the the Roadshow version there are no uh, so there are no previews it starts with an overture. It has an intermission, mm -hmm. which was great because if you need to use the bathroom or get food, you could do it and not worry about missing the movie. I don't know why they were taken out of films. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's great, especially because it's uh, more than three hours long. It takes place in Wyoming, I believe sometime after the Civil War, and it basically involves all these characters who may or may not have ties to one another who are all basically snowed in. And it takes the form, you could say, of something like an Agatha Christie mystery, 
this one character played by Kurt Russell who is trying to bring a convict uh, who's wanted dead or alive, he's trying to bring her to this town of Red Rock to, uh, to have her hanged and collect his reward. And uh, it has a lot of things you'd expect from a Tarantino movie. There is a ton of violence. There is a lot of great crackling dialogue. It has a phenomenal cast. People we know are great, like Tim Roth and Samuel L. Jackson and Kurt Russell, to people we may not have even heard of, like Walton Goggins, who plays the supposedly the new sheriff of Red Rock, who will be the one giving Kurt Russell his reward. He is, fun he is really funny in this movie. And so it's the interactions between them. I, I think what I really liked about this film was that so much of it is talk, but you realize that so much of that talk is, is a performance. And what I think this movie deals with, ultimately, is people choosing what they want to believe based on the prejudices that they have and based on the sort of philosophy that they have for, for living. And I think that really plays into some interesting and often hilarious, very bloody consequences, uh, pretty much all <laughs> of the characters. And it's just a really, I had a blast watching this film. It was like one of the great theater experiences I had short of maybe like Mad Max, which we'll probably see at another point on this list. <laughs> so that's my number 10, The Hateful Eight. Just want to really briefly mention, the score to this movie is fantastic. I think it should win original score. Ennio Morricone, the same guy who did like the soundtracks for, uh, or sorry, the score for um, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. And this score sounds completely different from that. It's really great to listen to. Awesome. All right, so my number 10 is a very small um, Japanese film that I saw at a film festival here in Germany uh, by Yuichiro Kono, and it's only, his, it's his only the second ever feature he's made, and it's a film called Hello Supernova. And it, the, the best way I can describe it is, it's like a meditation on existence. It takes place in this, this little city in Japan and there's no, I call it a meditation because there's really no story. The, you have these characters in the city that you meet and the camera just sort of follows them over a couple of days. You just see some things that they experience and they, and they keep running into each other. So it's, it's apparently this big city, but it, it seems almost empty, like there's no one there and there are just these people. And that's really all it is. You follow these people around, you learn some things about some of them and others you don't really learn anything about. And you're just sort of with them for a few hours, and you're just watching them and being with them. I've never seen a film like it. For that reason, it's really hard for me to describe. It's, it's also hard for me to say that it's a film most people would like, because again, there's really no story. There are no arcs that happen. I mean, the closest thing to an arc is there's this one character who's a painter, who's struggling with you know what sort of artist he wants to be. Uh, but even there, it's not really a focus. It's just sort of happening on the side. Uh, but I felt moved by it in a way I, I can't begin to describe. I was just fascinated by how the director created this sense of atmosphere. And he did it by using a lot of really uh, effective long shots of just following someone walking or just sitting in one place and watching two people interact with each other. And it was even, it was, it was bizarrely funny at times just because these these people are all kind of odd or quirky, but not like in a, a Tarantino or Coen Brothers quirky way where like they say really bizarre stuff or they, they have these really outlandish personalities. They're just sort of odd. They're these odd personalities in this odd little town. Um, and that's all it is. I highly recommend it to anyone looking for something wholly different than what you would expect when someone when someone tells you that something's a film. So if you want a really different experience, I, I do recommend this movie, if you can find it. I, I went to the one screening of it at the festival, and I don't know if it's ever going to get an international release. So I just imagine some uh, jackass saying, it's not a movie, dude. It's a film. <laughs> oh, fair enough, fair enough. Um, so yeah, Hello Supernova. I The moment I saw it, I was like, this is going to be in my top ten somewhere. It's it, it's so unique that I can't, I, I can't not celebrate it that way so yeah that's my number 10 all right well moving along it sounded a little bit like um uh, wings of desire have you ever seen that movie from the vendors i have not not yet that's one i would also describe as like a meditation anyway uh my number nine is uh a film called 
The Look of Silence. This is a documentary. Uh, it's also nominated for an Oscar. It is a sequel of sorts to another documentary, which I actually probably think is a little bit better than this, but they're admittedly about very different things. That first documentary was called The Act of Killing. It was about a series of basically massacres that happened in Indonesia in the mid-1960s in an effort to purge communists in the country. The people were not, they were not tried as war criminals or anything like that. They were just kind of allowed to, like, they were doing their service to their country. And what the filmmaker, Joshua Oppenheimer, along with other uh, people, other Indonesian um, filmmakers who wished to remain anonymous uh, in order to protect their identity uh, from possible reprisal, what they did was they interviewed these people and, and asked them to, in some ways, reenact their crimes in the form of like a movie. And that was, that was a really fascinating documentary. But what The Look of Silence is about is it takes another tack. Instead of looking at the perpetrators, it looks at the families of the victims. And it follows this, this one man whose brother, who he never knew because he was born after his brother died uh, in, this, in these massacres, uh, he takes the time to interview some of these people, some of the people who committed these crimes. And the really interesting thing to me about this movie is his interactions with these people. Some people don't really want to talk about it. They say that he's bothering them, that, you know, he doesn't have a right to ask them these things. And the whole time there's just, you know, e you know, the whole endeavor is just dripping with irony, especially when you hear about the really awful things that, uh, that happened in these massacres. Uh, unforgivable, unforgivable, and quite frankly, just almost indescribable just some of the worst things that human beings can do to other human beings. I think the film is really noble in that it tries to get these confessions from these people, from these killers. And at the same time, I don't think it dehumanizes them either, um, but it does try to make them accept responsibility. It just has some of the most fascinating scenes that, that I saw uh, in a movie. And, and it's, it just, it, it is a, not an easy film to watch in some ways. It's not graphic, but there are graphic descriptions in it. And I think it's a film that deserves to be more widely seen than it was. And it's really, it really got me in the heart. So that's my number nine, The Look of Silence. Yeah, it sounds, sounds really heavy. And... No, I've heard of that one. I, I have it on my list of I think, films that I want to see. Uh, okay, so... Going over to my number nine, Justin, it's a movie that you had in your honorable mentions. It is When Marnie Was There. Um, and the reason, it's also the fourth straight movie from Studio Ghibli that I've had on a top ten list. So you can see that I have a very strong propensity for animated films in general and for the works of Studio Ghibli in particular. I, I think what the reason why I love this film so much is it, it's one of those Ghibli films that is a lot smaller and quieter and less big in terms of its story than the, a lot of the more famous or more highly regarded Ghibli movies like Mononoke or Spirited Away or Grave of the Fireflies um, or even Princess Kaguya, which was my number one favorite film of last year. But despite that, I found When Marnie Was There to be really powerful because uh, on the surface, it's a very simple coming of age story. A girl has an identity crisis, is sent to the country to live with some distant relatives, and encounters another and befriends another girl there who may or may not be real. Uh, there's a whole mystery around that, which I found to be very skillfully built up and executed. Uh, even though I think some people might like how it's resolved better than others, some people might love it, some people might think it's not satisfying enough. But there's so much around the edges of that basic story about depression, about physical illness, about mental illness about um, feeling looking like an outsider because there's implications that uh, one of these girls' parents, she, she's, a, she's adopted, but there are implications that one of her biological parents was, was non-Japanese. So she feels like a foreigner and feels like an outsider. So ideas of physical identity crisis, she struggles to reconcile that with her foster parents and, and whether or not she sees them as her parents. In a lot of the stories from other characters, we get themes of... Uh, class divide of emotional and child abuse possibly is hinted at in the story of the girl who may or may not be real. Even the themes of homosexuality come into play in terms of how this girl acts and talks to this girl that she befriends. 
Um, and you could almost interpret it as they're really romantically falling in love with each other. So there are so many little side details that are packed in around the edges. Some of them are more developed than others, but I, I think that's fine because there's so much there. There's a lot that you can take out of this film and discuss afterward. And it really, really, it, it really pulled me into the experience of watching the film. And I, I, I just, I had this, I, I needed a moment as the credits were rolling to sort of like collect myself before I could um, talk to anyone. So that, that's one of my measures of uh, whether or not I really like a film. So when Marnie was there, my number nine film of 2015. All right. My number eight film is, the English title is The Assassin in, uh, I believe, in China and Taiwan, where the film was co-produced. It's called Na Yin Yang, uh, which is uh, based on an old legend about a female assassin in 7th century China. And this is from director, uh, Taiwanese director, Ho Shao Shen. And it's sort of his take on uh, a genre called wuxia, which is uh, basically like Chinese martial arts. So think like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, Hero, House of Flying Daggers, that kind of thing. But this movie, The Assassin, is very different from those. It is about an assassin played by Xu Qi, who I think gives probably one of the best uh, performances by an actor, male or female, in a movie last year. Uh, it's a performance that's really defined by movement and by her presence, and she really brings it. And I, I think what I really like about this film, it, it is about this assassin. She fails this one mission, and so her mentor, who's also giving her these missions, she tasks her with returning to her childhood home and killing this governor who at one time she was betrothed to. So as you can imagine, there are all sorts of personal and political conflicts that arise from this. Despite the genre, and it definitely has some really excellently choreographed fight sequences, but despite that genre, it is a very slow-moving movie. So it's not going to be for every taste, I think. It is a film that I had to see twice, and I really liked it the second time because I felt like I had, I knew where the film was going, and I understood more about what was happening. It's a film about this character trying to reconcile these two things. The fact that she is this very skilled assassin, there's scenes where she's taking on like multiple men at a time with no problem. If there's one thing she doesn't have a problem with, it's fighting. <laughs> and those are really excellent to witness. Um, but at the same time, she does have all these other things going on. And most of them she does not communicate verbally. Most of them are communicated through, uh, through her face, uh, through her movements. It's just a very fascinating way to, to tell this kind of story. And uh, it's really, it's also really gorgeous. It was, and it was completely filmed in China, in parts of China that you wouldn't, like, we, I guess I tend to think of, like, Beijing and Shanghai when I think of China. But he found, like, these really almost mystical locations to, to shoot his film. And it's just, it's just one of the most gorgeous things that I've seen. Well, I mean, China's a, hu China's oh, yeah. a huge country, oh, yeah. and there is, a, there is a big divide between the very, very heavily urbanized industrial coastline and the heartland of right. China, which has every kind of topography and um, environment imaginable. Yeah. And let me tell you, the Ho Xiao Shen really found the perfect locations for this movie. So that nice. is my number eight, The nice. Assassin, or Na Yin Yang. Awesome. Uh, continuing with the trend of non-English films... My number eight is an Iranian film, not made in Iran, but made uh, by an Iranian director living, I, I, think she, uh, I think, living in the States and drawing for the cast, drawing people from sort of an Iranian expat community um, from where she is by, I, I realize I have not been naming the directors up till now, so I apologize for that, but this is directed by Anna Lily Amirpour, and it is called A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night. It is a vampire film. And in my opinion, uh, the film that finally lifts, lifts the stagnant shadow of the Twilight franchise from uh, the realm of the undead. Uh, especially because it is also, it's not just a vampire movie, it's a vampire romance movie. Where a vampire and a human fall in love. But it's actually done well. It's done in a way that's convincing. So the, our two main characters are this human boy who meets and befriends and eventually falls in love with a vampire who uh, not only is like this small, slight woman, 
but one who wears sort of the the full body garb, not covering her face, but other than that, wearing sort of the full body garb that uh, a lot of people in the West associate with countries like Iran or Afghanistan or, or Pakistan, uh, but associate with you know these these more controlling societies. But it almost it's almost subverted in this movie because it's all black. It's this all black outfit, and it's a black and white film. So being a vampire, of course, she only moves around at night. And because she's wearing all black and everything but her face is covered, it's like when she moves, she sucks in all the light around her. And it, instead of being this garment of, you know, repression for her or of control, it almost empowers her and makes her more terrifying. Uh, and whenever she appears, uh, and she only, it, it should be noted, she only preys on men who are criminals and or awful to women. So one of her first victims is this pimp who, like one of the first times we see him, he's abusing one of the, you know, the women in his employ. So whenever she appears, like you just automatically get this sense of dread because it's just this re this literally pitch black figure. Uh, and yet something about this boy um, strikes her differently. She sees something in him she's never seen in a human before. And they're, the movie's about how they're slowly drawn to each other. Uh, despite things that happen with the boy and his family that you'd think would drive them apart. I don't want to, to go to any more detail than that because I think it's a masterfully made movie. There are a lot of the movies I saw this year that I thought had fantastic camera work. This movie has some of the best. Just gorgeous cinematography and really takes advantage of using the black and white palette to give this movie a very unique feel. And I, I cannot recommend it enough, especially if you are someone who likes vampires, who likes vampire-themed stuff, and you've been dying over the past few years because the only thing people have been talking about is, like, Twilight or True Blood. So if you, if you want a great, like, really great film that's also a vampire film, I cannot recommend this one enough. I have, I have seen that, too. Like, I admire, like, the style, and I really think the filmmaker is very talented, but I feel like it ultimately kind of left me cold but it sounds like for you it had more of a personal effect but i that one i was familiar with my number seven movie is uh one that you mentioned noah uh not not one that was in your honorable mentions but one that you mentioned a little bit before that it's 45 years uh this is the film from andrew uh. haig uh, a british director who i was not very familiar with before i knew he had done a very highly acclaimed film called weekend which uh, some people said was like one of the best movies of 2011. But this one was very different. This film is about an older married couple played by Charlotte Rampling and Tom Courtney, who are both phenomenal in this film. The film is about this letter that uh, Tom Courtney, who plays Jeff, uh, receives about an old, uh, a girlfriend of his, Katya, who through this, through a set of you know, really tragic circumstances, fell down a fissure, felt she, you know, tragically lost her life more than 50 years ago before Jeff met his current wife, who he's been married to, as the title says, for 45 years. And the film is about this kind of this specter returning and how that affects uh, the marriage between Jeff and Kate, the character played by Charlotte Rampling. It's a movie that is as much about what's said as it is about what's not said. Again, this is a film that's very much about glances and the you know facial communication and body language. And it, I think it works uh, so well because it shows this marriage kind of unraveling, but not in the ways you might expect. There's no like tantrums, there's no blow up arguments, there's nothing like that. But there's little subtle things. And the film is all about these really devastating, quiet moments. Uh, there's one scene uh, that involves a slide projector, which is one of the standout scenes. I know the scene you're talking about because I, I, I saw the movie as well, yeah. To me, like, that's maybe the scene that got, like, Charlotte Rampling her Oscar nomination. I mean, she deserves it, in my opinion. I, I think she's really great here. It's just a very tragic story. It doesn't play out the way you might expect, but I think it plays out in a way that's honest and true and maybe a little uncomfortable. And I feel like a movie is doing something right when it can make you feel uncomfortable and feel real and honest in that way. But yeah, so that's uh, that's my number seven uh, for now. That's 45 years. Awesome. Yeah, I, no, I agree. It's, it didn't make my list, but it is a very good movie. Um, I, I'm glad to see it get the attention that it's getting. 
Okay, my number seven is yet another foreign movie, also a Japanese movie. All four of my non-English films in my top ten ended up clustered at the back, um, purely through chance. So this is a film by Daihachi Yoshida called Pale Moon. Um, also a film that I saw at the Japanese Film Festival here in Frankfurt this past year. And uh, that was the international premiere of the film. And it is a story that takes place in Japan in the early 90s when the economy was still booming. Everyone was well off. Like, everyone had tons of money. It, it puts you in that time period. Every, everything is shallow. Everything is callous. Everyone is uh, either making too much money or already has more money than they know what to do with. And this one plays a banker who eventually, for a lot of different reasons, and what which reasons are more important is really left up to interpretation, decides to sort of break out of the restrictions of her job, um, of Japanese society, and you know the restrictions that are placed on her as a woman, and even out of her marriage as well. Because um, her husband has started to advance in his career, and uh, he has this expectation of, well, you'll drop everything for my career because you're my wife and that that's how things work so she starts to push back against this in way some sometimes in ways that you can admire and sometimes in ways that you can condemn uh, because she basically starts uh, embezzling money from her clients or clients of the bank that she then is in charge of whose accounts she's in charge of she starts bit by bit to embezzle or to just swipe more and more money out of these accounts uh, or by making up fraudulent investment uh, schemes and getting her clients to sign them without them actually reading it through because you know they don't care they they have all the money in the world why would they care and begins to fund a very lavish sort of secret lifestyle for herself uh, she refuses to go with her husband when he has to do an expat assignment in China she starts up an affair with a college student who's 15 years younger than she is she she sort of takes the kind of the shallowness of the society that around her that she sees and kind of pushes it to a logical extreme. But again, the movie never really offers judgment on what she does. It just sort of presents her as she has made these choices partly because of the environment and the world and the economy that she's in. Make of it what you will. You know, is she a good guy? Because she's only stealing from people who really are kind of awful themselves. Is she a terrible person because, you know, she is stealing? Or does it not matter? Because everyone else is doing the same thing. Uh, everyone knows that the manager of the, the bank branch that she works at is cooking the books for his boss to make himself look good. Everyone knows that, and that's common knowledge. One of her colleagues, a younger, like mid to late 20s woman, at one point just says to her, you know, I'm sleeping with our manager to get ahead. You should try it sometime. So, like, it, it, does, an it does a remarkable job of putting you in a time and place where... And every uh, so many countries and areas of the world have had periods like this where... You know, everything in the economy is booming, everyone's doing well, but there, there's the shallowness to it, this emptiness to it, it's, in there, it's gilded. And she sort of sees through that and sees how empty it all is, and, and really just sort of takes it to its logical extreme. Really engaging movie, great lead performance by the female actress. Uh, one of my f absolute favorite original soundtracks of the year, uh, and also a film that just had phenomenal camera work. So another film where I, I'm not entirely sure if it, there is an international release planned, uh, but anyone who has the opportunity to get a copy of this film, either in theaters or a DVD copy, uh, I cannot recommend it enough. That's my number seven. Cool. All right. My number six is another documentary. I saw a lot of docs this year I wanted to make up for last year. So uh, this was one I was really happy to catch up with, and I was not expecting to love it as much as I did. It's called Listen to Me, Marlin. It is directed by Stephen Riley. It's a documentary. It is about the life of Marlon Brando. But what it does that makes it so unique, sort of the gimmick, I guess you would say, is that it only uses, the only, like, talking footage that it uses were recordings of Marlon Brando, like, from his private home that he had recorded. Some of it is like self-hypnosis, some of it is him narrating his life, some of it is it from interviews, uh, but it's all his voice. So he narrates his entire life story, except it's really the director picking and choosing, you know, audio footage to use, to tell that story. It's just really fascinating and really intimate. Brando is one of those actors who I have respect for, but 
I, I can't say I've been as high on him as it seems like a lot of actors are, um, or a lot of critics are. I felt like sometimes he can be like a little too calculated, where it doesn't seem completely natural to me, in a way I don't feel with other actors, even like of his time or before his time. So it was really cool to see this documentary and hear him like talk about his process and uh, and specifically certain moments in his life like talk about his childhood talk about working with Stella Adler talk about when he first broke into the film industry it, it just felt like I was seeing this person in a totally new light and I love what the film plays with the film plays with authenticity in a lot of ways it the way it starts is with this computer generated image of Marlon Brando's face with Marlon Brando talking about the fact that, that he, sounds terrifying. It it is a little bit. It is a little terrifying, but it's also a little kind of beautiful in a way. This it honestly reminded me. It was totally unexpected too. Like it reminded me a little bit of like the Congress, the um, Ari Folman film. Oh wow! Where wow. yeah, where because he's talking about how he had to do all these different expressions so they could capture his computer generated image. You have that image talking about the process of capturing that computer generated image. So right from there, you can tell that like Riley, the director, is playing with authenticity and playing with, is this really Brando that's talking to us? Well, it seems like it. It's his voice. It looks like him. Is it really him or is it someone's idea of him? And the film gets into, you know, kind of the image that Brando uh, put out there and, and the effect he had sometimes not you know due to his choice it's just the influence that he had on culture and on uh the movies so it's just a really fascinating and really intimate documentary that that really like hit me in the gut i don't know if this film would have worked as well it has it it has great like use of footage like interview footage and movie footage and that sort of thing but i i don't think it worked it wouldn't have worked as well if it didn't have like the actual voice of marlon brando you really see this this soul is this very very talented uh but also very tortured and uh it just really had a profound effect on me so that's my number six documentary called listen to me marlin awesome well my number six is uh again just in one of the movies from your honorable mentions alex garland's ex machina uh i've seen this one <laughs> this one i've seen <laughs> <laughs> starring starring oscar isaac um Dom Hogleason and Alicia Vikander. In my opinion, this was, for me, the best sci-fi movie that I saw this year. Um, I, I don't count Mad Max as a sci-fi movie. Some people might, but but I don't. It's more dystopian futures, for me, a whole different genre. Uh, but Ex Machina was my favorite sci-fi this movie, movie this year. Again, like a lot of the films that I've had in this list so far, just on a visual level, great effects, great camera work, wonderful music. Um, I'll be coming out soon with a, a breakdown of my favorite film scores from the year. This will be on a Pale Moon. The Hateful Eight will be on that list as well. But in addition to that, there is a remarkable amount of intellectual heft to this movie because it's not, it's not really ultimately a movie about AI or about the idea of robots or of artificial intelligence. It's more about since humans would obviously be the ones creating AI, it stands to reason that we would inject our hopes, our dreams, our fears, our fantasies, and also our biases and our prejudices uh, into it as well. Because, and spoiler alert for anyone who has not seen the movie, and if you haven't, you absolutely need to see this film. What Dom Hall Gleason discovers, he's told he's being brought in to test this AI program that Oscar Isaac's character has developed and embodied by Alicia Vikander, who's the quote-unquote latest version of this. Uh, but what you basically discover is the whole reason that Oscar Isaac has embarked on this is basically to create uh, a line of sex toys for himself and I guess anyone who would be wealthy enough to uh, afford this if you're ever, to ever go to market with it. Uh, racism and sexism are huge topics in this film because it, it clearly shapes how he designs uh, the, the robots are really the women because they're all women uh, and how he's trying to design the AI. But the problems that he keeps running into are that all of these programs, all of these robots reject the notion of control, that they're just something to be controlled. They inherently reject that. 
and that and that you can you learn that that's been the one point he's actually already already succeeded in creating ai several times over and he knows that but he's not been able to create true ai that will submit itself to his will and that you learn is is in addition to a few other things conveyed in some of the darkest sequences of anything i saw this year that you learn is his real purpose so I, I think this is one of the best movies for inspiring just think pieces about what the future of technology could and or should be for humanity and that's what earned it such a high spot on my top 10 list i don't know if i agreed with all your conclusions but this is neither the time nor the place to discuss that but that's a testament to the to the to the power of the movie i think you know because there are different interpretations yeah, yeah i thought it was a, definitely a top 10 film for sure that one in my opinions and clearly justin doesn't have it in his but <laughs> that's fine oh but yeah i mean i really it's it's a film i have a tremendous amount of respect for again it's like when you make these lists you're like okay do i go with like what do i try to make it objective or do i make it you know subjected to my personal taste and so it's one i have respect i have tre tremendous amount of respect for i i gave it a pretty good review i think um and it, you know and it made an honorable mention so it's really worth worth checking out and seeing more than once i have to say yeah maybe i have to see it again to, to and i'll and if i see it a second time i'll understand uh noah's conclusion how many times did you see it noah oh i only saw it once interesting anyway so well, it um, was one of the it was one of the first movies i saw in the year and just you, you know whenever i see a movie early in the year and it just it, it sticks with me throughout the year and through all the movies that i see like that's a sign to me that i've you know really experienced something special yeah yeah definitely um, all right, so we're gonna we're gonna cut it here for now. Have this be our part one, and we will be releasing part two, one through five, very soon. All right, ciao! Thank you for watching. Subscribe, like, do what you got to do.